Hello, I'm Mark Dunn, and I'm the editor of Portfolio Institutional Magazine. And I'm going to be your host for this discussion, which looks at fixed income. Now, this is quite a big topic for institutional investors. It is rare to find a pension scheme or insurer who does not have bonds in their portfolio. Not only do they provide regular income for those needing to fund members' benefits, but they can also be a good risk management tool. But we are in a low yield environment. COVID has brought economic uncertainty and Warren Buffett has painted quite a bleak outlook for the asset class. So what's going on? To find out, we've assembled a panel of experts. I think a good place to start is if they just introduce themselves. Um, I'm going to start at the top right of my screen as I always do. Peter, can you kick us off? Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Peter Martin. I'm the um, Chief Investment Officer of the Medical Defence Union. Uh, we're a not-for-profit mutual, um, roughly a billion pounds in assets and under management, and uh, previously head of management research at JLT. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you, thank you, very much, Peter. And Ian. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian McRae. I am the Pensions and ma Investment Manager at Jaguar Land Rover. That's an in-house company role, so it's in Treasury. Um, and that role covers uh, GLR's strategy for investments and funding for our, our DB pension schemes, which have assets around eight and a half billion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Good job, Wills. Jim. Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Solensky. I am Global Head of Fixed Income at Janice Henderson Investors, where we run a range of both domestic and global um, as well as different types of credit mandates. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Killian. Hi, good morning. I'm Killian Davison, Investment Manager at the National Grid UK Pension Scheme, uh, primarily looking after the implementation of the various allocations, starting from LDI going all the way down or up the risk spectrum to, uh, to private equity and other private investments. Thanks, Killian. Carl. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Carl Hitchman. I'm the Chief Investment Officer at uh, Block Investment Consulting in the UK. Gotcha. Thanks, Carl. And last but not least, not, not least, Alan. My name is Alan Pickering. I'm a professional trustee, but I'm a generalist rather than a technical person. Mm. My interest is in determining what role bonds should play in my DB schemes, wherever they are on their journey plan, and in my DC schemes, depending on how complicated the investment structure can be for each of those DC arrangements. Good, good you. So thank you, and I'm sure we'll get to discuss some of those in the next hour or so. Um, Killian, could we start with you? Um, could you tell us a little bit more about what your fixed income strategy is and how you're using bonds? Uh, look, I think what, what's key to understand is that the net grid scheme in the UK is relatively mature. Um, mm -hmm. So what results from this is that we do have quite some allocations to fixed income. Uh, uh, and these allocations are primarily in the investment grade space. We use them uh, also to contribute to our overall LDI hedge target. Um, next to that, there are some uh, pockets or, uh, where we're a bit more opportunistic uh, and uh, aiming to generate alpha versus an investable benchmark or alpha on an absolute, uh, from an absolute perspective. Um, these allocations are then a bit more tactical, whilst, let's say, uh, the bulk of, uh, of the exposures uh, is invested for the long term. Uh, you, you think about buy and maintain portfolios or also investments in the private space uh, where we're also looking to harvest an additional illiquidity premium over uh, a public market uh, equivalent bond. Okay, well, thank you, Killian. Ian, can we talk a little bit about your your bond strategy? Sure. So. And it's, it's worth sort of taking a little step back and what we're what we're trying to achieve and and mm. the roles that, that various types of bonds play in our portfolio we um we we run two possibly three distinct portfolios within within the schemes and um, with different aims and um, initially uh, we had a simple growth and ldi strategy we've now uh, developed that to add another strategy, which is a, a an income-based strategy to back pensioner liabilities, uh, mm -hmm. with the intention that we create a secure and reliable 
income stream um, to match the the benefit outgo for pensioners only. Our schemes are relatively mature, so that only makes up around 40% of our um, of our asset base, and the rest, the other 60%, is split between a traditional growth and LDI approach. And then, obviously, within the L, within LDI, we're we're looking to match um, um, interest rate and inflation risk, and we within the growth portfolio, we're using a variety of of, of bonds for diversification mm-hmm. and for um, different types of um, alpha and, and and risk premium access to different risk premiums. Great, Chris. Thanks, thanks, a lot, Ian. Alan, we turn to you. Um, your your DB schemes will be uh, close to our end game, or many of them will be. So, what type of fixed income assets are you going for? What's the strategy there? In my DB schemes, at the heart of most of them is an LDI portfolio, because, as you say, Mark, mm. we are on a journey plan, and for three of the four schemes that journey plan will probably come to an end during this decade. So the LDI portfolio is very much created by the chosen asset manager. In the run-up to buy-in, buy-out, we are using bonds to uh, provide some diversification, some risk management and to some extent, creating a uh, buy-in, buy-out ready portfolio. So, mm-hmm. for instance, we might be using a fairly short duration income generating mm-hmm. bonds, which can be very easily uh, liquidated when they, the time comes for, for buy-in and buy-out. In the largest of my defined benefit schemes that's Mm -hmm. further away from retirement and again there is an LDI portfolio at the heart of it but as we move towards low dependency on the sponsoring employers we are trying to tap into different aspects of the fixed income market a to provide us a return perhaps slightly north of bonds, but B, to facilitate the transition as we uh, lock down even further as we prepare for buy-in, buy-out. And Mark, I'll talk about DC later on when you prompt me. Okay. Well, that sounds a good time for a prompt. Um, How does it differ on the DC side? On the DC side, during the accumulation phase, I guess the jury is out as to whether it should be go-go growth all the way or whether there should be a bond element within the default arrangements. And obviously, there is a lot of thought being given to diversification and multi-asset at all points on the accumulation phase if it is used in the accumulation phase i'm more in favor of dynamic management of the fixed income portfolio rather than a a passive approach as we come to the consolidation and horrible decumulation phase again there will be a role for fixed income when it comes to the self select element within a DC scheme, again, I would support the use of a, a dynamic option rather than a, a passive option. Interesting that. Thank, thank you, Alan. Um, Jim, if you can turn to you, we've heard from the, the trustees, the, the asset owners in the discussion, but um, you can give us a wider view of what's going on in the market. What, what, what are clients asking for these days from their fixed income portfolio? Well, uh, I would view it as a bit of a dichotomy today. I think we have a lot of clients who are seeking income. There's such a dearth of income, I think, even with the rate and yield increases we've seen recently. I think income, but income with risk control, income with a defined drawdown, things like that, I think is one element. And that kind of ties into that more benchmark agnostic style that I think we just heard about. 
But equally, I think there's a lot of focus from our clients, um, and, and particularly away from DB, on shorter duration products, um, okay. limiting interest rate risk. I think with rates last year kind of moving to extraordinarily low levels, right? I mean, I think uh, as far as we can tell, it's kind of the lowest yields, you know, since the time of the pharaohs. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so there is a desire to have credit risk of many types or mortgage, emerging market risk, um, the ability to rotate across sectors more, say, than just owning interest rate risk. And so I think we've seen a bit of a shift, more conservative on the rate risk side. Okay. Um, we still have a number of clients who want the kind of you know, longer duration if they're trying to hedge liabilities. Mm. But more often than not, they want that agnostic approach. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So thank you, Jim. Touched on some interesting points there, so I'm sure we'll come back to you. Um, Carl, um, what are you seeing in the market from, from asset owners when it comes to their fixed income? Uh, well, we've been speaking to quite a number of our, our clients, uh, I guess, along similar lines that uh, Ian and Kellyanne have actually spoken to uh, just before in terms of focusing more on uh, very much on, on the cash flows, basically. So as, essentially, it's sort of, I guess it's a play on, on CDI. It's actually looking to say, well, the starting point is, well, do you have sufficient money to actually effectively invest uh, in a portfolio of both gilts and different types of credit? If not, then actually how much do you actually need to hold in growth assets to actually sort of fill the gap? But in holding those growth assets, the, the portfolios are typically structured such that the, the assumptions of growth assets are held for the longer term. Mm -hmm. So you're effectively and notionally allocating them against your cash flows 15, 20 years down the line. So uh, as, essentially, you know, you're letting those growth assets grow. You're not going to be a forced seller of those assets, but what you can do is actually exploit the upside volatility. Um, you know, if those growth assets actually sort of deliver much stronger returns than anticipated. Uh, and that's essentially sort of, you know, what we've been talking to clients about and sort of building portfolios within that framework. But I think key to all this is that, you know, over time as the pension funds mature, uh, as has been alluded to just now, is that, you know, fixed income is going to become a much bigger and bigger component of portfolios down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really sort of, you know, where we're focusing our, our efforts. Got you, got you. Thank, thank you for that, Carl. Um, Peter, um, we've heard from everyone else in the discussion. Um, any comment you'd like to make on what you've heard so far? Well, first of all, um, I agree with everything that's been said. It's, it's all very sensible. I would just say from our perspective, um, the, the use of bonds uh, is an important component, mm -hmm. but given that we're an evergreen mutual, again, since 1885, and presumably we'll go on to 3,085 at the very least, um, um, is that we're trying to make use of bonds as more of a holistic part of our armory to, to generate a return and or income if necessary. Um, so I think in bonds, it's a question of um, being open-minded, looking where, looking where the opportunities are, um, but not taking excessive risk. Um, I think for us, it's trying to obtain a sensible return in the, in the context of um, this is contractual income, and if contractual income can generate the sort of returns that which are required, then that's job done. It's about, not necessarily about maximising return. It's about trying to get the appropriate return in the combination of assets which are available, which will include other areas of equities, property and, and, and other areas. So I think that's where we're coming from. But I think going forward, um, as I think Jim and, uh, was saying, is that uh, um, you have to be cognizant of the environment that we're currently in, yeah. where rates are low, and probably rates are lower forever, well, at least for our working lifetimes, and uh, and spreads are are tight. So you know, quality you know is safe and stable and, and may be appropriate for some people, but uh, um, mm. um, it's not. I would say it's a modest and uh, mediocre returns going forward, at least for the foreseeable future. So you have to say, you know, is that sufficient or do you have to go up the risk profile in order to make the return? But, you know, there's a quid pro quo there. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there is no free lunch. And, and I think in bond space, it's with um, stability, capital preservation is key, strong underwriting. And we'll talk about COVID and the pandemic impact, no doubt, at some point. But, but you know, we're in a very different environment where the easy money from, if there were ever such thing as easy money five, 10, 20 years ago, that's certainly gone.
Good, show, good, show. okay, good point. Thank you very much, Peter. And actually, point on there actually, as well as everything else that's happening um, in the fixed income markets at the moment, uh, the markets in general are quite a big shock uh, in the past year. And as we speak now in the UK, we are we are just coming out of a, um, a lockdown, but we're still very much within it. So, um, has the pandemic made what kind of what kind of impact has the pandemic had on on fixed income portfolios? Jim, have, have you seen any change, or is it just business as usual for for the asset owners? No, I think it's quite a different environment. So aside from the fact that rates plummeted to mm -hmm. record lows, as yeah. I mentioned, and became quite overvalued against most metrics, I think what has really changed in the background is, is kind of the regime in which we live, right? This was the crisis that kind of passed the baton, for, you know, say from monetary to fiscal policy. It's created fears of this kind of modern monetary theory um, mm -hmm. notion, which is that you can borrow, you know, unlimited amounts and it stays affordable. Mm -hmm. So I think you've seen a real shift, I, I think, in terms of how the policy reaction function will work. And, and to me, these are the kinds of things that when you look back, you can often say, you know, this was a this was a real moment in history that our framework had to kind of adjust. So I think what happens going forward, the outlook for inflation, you know, the outlook for deficit spending, you know, the outlook for politics and, you know, whether you know, we increasingly see people get elected on the basis of promising more spending. You know, I think this is the environment that we find ourselves in. And the jury is still out on many of these questions. Gotcha. Okay. So thank you, Jim. Um, Alan, um, has this had any effect on your decisions and you, your fellow trustees on, on some of the schemes that you work on? Yes, I think that um, quantitative easing and modern monetary theory has really uh, prompted us to uh, rip up everything that we learned when we uh, studied textbooks or went on courses in our youth. So I guess mm -hmm. it's created a an air of uncertainty, an air, an air of, of challenge, which I guess is a good thing. We, we can't take anything for, uh, for granted. Who would have guessed that we'd have... Uh, big government to the extent we have big government in both uh, the UK and the US and in many other territories. I guess at a more micro level, what the pandemic has done has forced us to, to concentrate on, on quality. We hear a lot about mm. covenant. I think we also need to concentrate on the, the covenant of those who are on the other side of these fixed income products to a greater extent perhaps than we we ever did before so we've got uncertainty at a macro level and uncertainty mm -hmm. at a micro level which i guess selfishly is what makes my job so enjoyable <laughs> thank you thank you alan um ian um alan there talked about a focus on quality is that is that a particular change that you guys uh, you and your fellow yeah, a lot, of, a lot of the comments that have been made uh, actually resonate. I mean, our, our structure um, is, is based on moving as, um, as liabilities mature, moving the asset holdings from the sort of growth LDI to this um, CDI type approach that we have. And that does actually give us opportunities over time to take mm -hmm. advantage of, of different pricing in the market and the, the relative pricing either from cash or from the growth assets to moving to uh, different, the, the CDI bond portfolio. The CDI bond portfolio itself is made up of different types of, of, of fixed income and, and we can rotate around that. So, so I do think, and I think Peter was, was mentioning this, the price that you can buy assets is, is, is what it is, but the relative price that you can buy assets, so when fixed income becomes less expensive and you have cash you can use to buy it, then that's, that's a good thing. Or where growth assets become um, more highly valued relative to fixed income, that gives you an opportunity to buy it. So I think the turbulence we saw over um, 2020 was certainly helpful for us. And then we were able to transition more of our liabilities into our CDI portfolio at, at, at good, good prices relative to the, the assets we were selling. Um, and that's actually continuing. Um, and uh, now, so that's that's 
what the the sort of turbulence has, has done for us and um, the other point um about the the security the covenant of of the bonds we buy is absolutely critical especially when we're we're intending to buy bonds in the cdi portfolio that uh, we will be holding ideally through to maturity mm -hmm. we don't want to be trading these so we we need to buy bonds that we are very confident will maintain their quality uh, and, and certainly maintain their income and and that comes in lots of different forms whether it's just the covenant or, or whether it's the, the collateralization behind the bonds thank you ian um, and killian um how has national grid reacted to the event of the past year yeah i can i can only echo ellen and and, and ian on uh, with what they said with regard to what they said um i uh, in particular i think was it february march when we saw this significant spread widening that was a very interesting time uh, to indeed move uh, some of the allocations a bit more into the investment grade uh, long-term credit space uh, because uh, quite some fundamentals of issuers had not significantly changed over the longer term yet you were able to lock in uh, an almost uh, 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 twice as high spread as a month before so it was a quite an opportune time but I'm um, being careful with using the, uh, the term opportune uh, mm -hmm. so you always got to be very prudent careful in particular during these really volatile crises um, so we did use uh, this opportunity though, uh, however, uh, more than ever uh, are and, uh, and have been back then aware of the relevance of downside and terrorist management. So we go back to the, the covenant uh, point that was mentioned before, it is highly essential to have a long term view on, uh, on the company and a bit touching uh, upon probably what we're going to discuss uh, next mark, the ESG angle. Uh, I think uh, that also came into play quite significantly because mm -hmm. uh, uh, having a clear idea of how uh, does an issuer align its strategy uh, with the upcoming energy tr uh, transition uh, is absolutely crucial. If you're looking to invest for 10 years plus, uh, you're going to get this right. Otherwise, you may end up uh, trading uh, at some point and, and, and trading at an increased uh, uh, and widened spread. And that's not the idea when they say these buy, buy, maintain, buy, uh, buy and hold to maturity type of portfolios and strategies. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you very much for that, uh, Killian. Um, moving on now to inflation, Jim. Uh, inflationary fears have been rising, they've been rising, of course. Um, do you expect that to continue? I, I certainly don't see it dissipating, but I would note that markets have priced in quite a lot of inflation now. So you know, in, in most developed markets, we're looking at, say, 2.5%. For example, the, the U.S. is even a little bit higher than that today in terms of longer-term inflation expectations. And it's actually been quite difficult if you look at the last 30 or 40 years to get meaningfully above that. So I think the inflation expectations have really been behind the rate increases that we've seen this year. To expect that to continue from these levels, though, I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking that will, will unfold. That said, inflation will be higher in the next few months. Quoted inflation is typically done on a year-on-year -year basis. So we're now moving into this period where we had the pandemic-related deflation about a year ago. Combine that with commodity prices and things like that, and, and you're likely to see some inflation numbers that certainly look a lot worse than they have. <clears throat> I don't really think that leads to another big round of inflation fears. Um, I'm more worried about the level of real rates, for example, and whether growth globally, whether that coordinated global growth that seems to be kind of taking off is strong enough to really drive the level of real rates higher. Gotcha, gotcha, okay, okay thanks, Jim. Um, Peter, your thoughts on inflationary fears continuing to rise? Um. I think it's always right to consider, I wouldn't mm -hmm. say fear, but it's it's appropriate to consider, you know, how exposed are you in your circumstances to the risk of inflation or unexpected inflation, you know, either on the positive or the negative, and then sort of to scenario plan your circumstances around that, and whether or not, you know, um, you can withstand that within your current portfolio and how you're taking your risks. Or, or whether there's any form of tail risk management there. 
Um, and uh, but, but, but I think these days the conversation is, um, I appreciate most of the audience will be pension funds, is that mm -hmm. uh, um, there, there is still a pent up demand for inflation protection in, in pension funds, yeah. Yeah. and that's not going to go away mm -hmm. in the UK context. I know there's much more chat chat about the reflation issue, but from, forgive me, Jim, but I tend to view that tends to be a, a, a US story. Mm. Although, you know, the inflation is still important in the UK context. Mm. Um, so, so I think the price of UK inflation will remain expensive. It's expensive now, especially at the long end. But I think the pent up demand will continue to be um, expensive, given the pent up demand from, from, from pension funds. Okay. Um, and now we've got the clarification of the RPI reform or the CPI changes in 2030, I think you'll see more trading because that uncertainty is gone now. So at least we have a little bit more knowledge of what the current mm -hmm. environment will be. Um, um, so it's a question on, on a relative value basis is whether or not you're prepared to pay for linker inflation from gilts or, or swap curve, or whether you need to look for um, other areas which we can produce you embedded inflation in the assets. Now, that may be corporate linkers, or it may be other forms of housing association or other forms of debt. So again, it's looking holistically with it being a part of the CDI portfolio. As for Ian, whether you can buy um, inflation protection through the bonds, which can help match your um, cash flows, or whether you look it through through other areas. So I think you have to look, think a little bit more holistically. But the way, way I view it, especially for MDU, is that um, Yes, we, there is an inflation component and it is important, mm -hmm. um, but we, we try and play it ju judiciously uh, and think about the risks of not doing and and, and, do, and doing the matters. So I think compared to pension fund, we've got a little bit more flexibility, but with my trustee hat, I'm the trustee of the MTU schemes, um, it's about de-risking, especially for pension funds. So if you can take the risk off the table, then it's a price worth paying. Mm -hmm. especially in pension fund context, but you can still play that journey sensibly. So, so that's where I would come from. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, Carl, uh, Jim says that um, inflation has been priced into the market. I mean, has it been priced into gilts? And if so, does that mean that investors are overpaying for the for bonds? Interesting question, um, because I guess uh, looking at the, the shape of the um, forward uh, inflation curve, post RPI, CPI, um, perhaps the um, the inflation uh, pricing post 2030 didn't actually come down as much as perhaps would, would have been sort of expected. Um, I think that um, I certainly think the, the risk of inflation uh, has increased. Um, I think mm -hmm. the, the, the extent of the, 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 uh, the fiscal stimulus and the, the arguments surrounding MMT uh, do actually, I agree with Jim, sort of push us into a different space in terms of um, uh, you know, is, a, is the policy response going to be enough to help us through the crisis? Or is the policy response going to be such that it's going to stoke inflation moot points? Um, you know, nobody really knows is, is a frank answer. I think also that, you know, we've over the last 20, 30 years, we've been on a, there's all sorts of reasons why sort of uh, inflation has come down and has been very sticky. Uh, there's lots of discussion and debate out there around the impact of demographic changes, et cetera, and whether actually that is, you know, uh, about to start shifting um, uh, in reversing backwards. Um, the reality is, I think from a pension funds in terms of risk management, I think the key thing about this is actually to recognise the risks and uh, and actually uh, make sure you're actually managing those risks of effectively in the pension fund. And actually, if you look at what some of the markets just this quarter, um, it's given you just a little bit of a taste of actually what potentially could happen you know, with rates rising and some of the leverage LDI portfolios all of a sudden sort of, you know, uh, the trigger points starting to to be hit or close to being hit, uh, and pension funds having to then the cash calls being made to to fund these. You know, over the last ten years or so, as rates have been coming down, leverage LDI has actually been wonderful, not only in terms of um, generating very strong returns, mm -hmm. but it's also been throwing a lot of cash off as well, which has helped in paying benefits and helping sort of um, sort of rebalance portfolios effectively. Okay. 
the challenge, of course, is if it, if it does start going the other way and you start making these cash calls, you have to fund that cash from somewhere, uh, assuming you want to keep your hedging. And the question then is, does that start actually eating into, for instance, your growth assets, which you're relying on to actually fund any deficits? So it's absolutely crucial when actually setting strategies in this environment that you actually factor in the, the, the risk, and the, in my view, the increasing risk of rising rates, and actually have appropriate you know, liquidity and collateral ladders in place that mm -hmm. won't jeopardise the long-term funding of the scheme. Um, and, you know, and from that perspective, I think you know, considerations of inflation are absolutely key, given where we currently are now and the, the fiscal response that has actually come our way. Thank you, Carl. You made some quite interesting points there. Um, Killian, um, Carl said that uh, inflation risk has increased and that inflation is actually a key when considering um, your portfolios. I mean, how have you been hedging if have been hedging inflation risk? To a major extent, I must say that that's driven by our very advanced uh, funded status. Uh, so uh, hedge ratios uh, have been aligned to this, and uh, you know inf inflation uh, uh, is uh, to us is a risk that we look to hedge, similar uh, as we look to hedge rate risk. Mm -hmm. uh, but I very much agree with Carl. Uh, liquidity slash collateral management has been key over the last couple of, of weeks and months. Uh, that's uh, so we we did not get any into uh, any difficult situation there, but it's certainly a space that we watch. Good, good, yeah. Um, Ian, really the same really, same question to you. I mean, how have you been? Have you, have you been hedging risk in the past year? Yeah, so we, yeah, I think sort of in line with a lot of the comments that Carl has made, and um, we we look at our our inflation and and, and rates risk from a. You know, do we want to have that risk in the first place? So we're he we're heavily hedged um, against these risks, and as, as you say, that's been very positive. While well, rates been coming down, um, we we clearly need to look at um, where that could go, and so the risk of of higher rates. I think on the on the inflation side, I, I definitely agree. It appears that um, in the UK, uh, the cost the cost of of hedging inflation is very high. Uh, especially post 2030, um, and as, as Peter mentioned, you know we do use a lot of in our in our CDI um, portfolio. We use a lot of assets, real assets, to 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 access sort of inflation uh, protection there. But we but we overlay that with uh, with direct uh, inflation hedge, and um, that is again that's a risk that we we need to consider. You know the 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 cost of that of of hedging that risk versus the um, the, the reduction in, in potential volatility we get from from hedging, so so it's, it's this kind of continual circular sort of reevaluation of of cost of hedging versus the benefits of of, of hedging, and I, I definitely would suggest that people start from a position of well, if you don't want the risk, you need to hedge it, but if you if you can take some risk, you can move away from that fully hedged position to some extent, and um, but not necessarily just deciding. Oh, I don't, I don't like pricing of, of a risk. Therefore, I'm not. I'm going to set that whole risk. Right, got you, got you. So, thank you very much, Ian. Um, Jim, turn now to fiscal and monetary policy. How do you think that will affect the pricing of bonds and risk assets going forward? I think for monetary policy, mm -hmm. I, I think its effect is really limited now to the forward path of short-term rates, and and by that I mean to the extent that they can stay on hold forever, central banks can stay on hold forever. Mm -hmm. I think monetary policy is now going to have less of an effect and it's really up to fiscal to drive bond markets. Now, at some point you probably do start to price in some rate hikes, but I think that's a, a, a long way off. So if I'm looking at bond market drivers near term, I'm looking at fiscal policy and mm -hmm. you know, trying to see if globally central banks can kind of keep testing the limits of how much they can borrow and, and spend you know, before it pushes bond markets a little bit too high. And, and, and when you do that, it can be self-correcting. At, at some point, we're going to reach a limit where bond yields might go too high and impact other risk assets and, and things like that. But for now, I think it's really about the, you know, the fiscal stimulus. Um, keep in mind, too, it's not just spending now, but it's the fiscal cliff that gets created a year out from now, right? So one-off big expenditures, as they fade, 
they become detractors, right? So everything feels great right now, um, but in a year we might be looking at a very different story. And I think this all just kind of sums up to, I, I think, spell more volatility. There's going to be more uncertainty and more volatility on both inflation rates and policy going forward. Okay, okay. Thanks for that, Jim. Alan, just bring you in there. Are you expecting to see more volatility going forward? Yeah, um, Mark, you missed me out on the straightforward investment question. Can I just say a few words? Inflation question. I, mean, I was around in the 1980s when it was argued that uh, private sector schemes couldn't give the same inflation protection that public sector schemes because there weren't any instruments. So Mrs. Thatcher's government introduced inflation-linked guilt and nobody bought them. And if you apply the same test to when members had to convert their defined contribution pot into an income stream, they nearly always bought a non-increasing pension. So there has been an unholy alliance between the, the sophisticates and the not so sophisticates who have said there's a limit to how much of a price you want to pay for protection against inflation. And I think today that argument still holds good that the approach to inflation should be scheme specific. And if the employer and the trustee wants to batten down all risks, then they may be willing to pay a higher price for uh, battening down the inflation mm -hmm. risk. And in DC land, members may be sensible in battening down inflation risk if the pension is their only income that they have in retirement. But if they have other incomes, then they might be a bit more relaxed about battening down every single risk. And so far as volatility is concerned, then I think there will be uh, increased volatility in the future as large amounts of money seek to uh, exploit opportunities or react to uncertainty. And I guess as a long-term investor, volatility can be your friend. But if you have a short-term horizon, as many defined benefit schemes have, then volatility could well be your enemy. Gotcha. gotcha. Th thank you very much for that, Alan. Thank you. Um, perhaps we could stick with you, move on now to actually um, away from things like hedging um, inflation and things like that, and more towards a person doing it for you. I mean, how do you go about selecting uh, a bond fund manager? I mean, how, do you, how do you decide to, to go with someone like Jim? And what's the process? I mean, as a trustee, I rely very heavily on the intermediary, the consultant. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I need a consultant in whom I have confidence, confidence in that consultant's ability to understand the market and understand what I require from that market. And one of the advantages of being a professional trustee is that I don't necessarily need a household name, provided that the consultant can uh, convince me that the bona fide of the proposed fixed income manager is uh, has a good covenant, use that word again, that, they, that that advisor is here to stay, then uh, I would put a great deal of faith in the advisor's ability to provide me with a fixed income manager that is not only good, but is appropriate. Gotcha. And just Carl, over to you. I mean, how do you find a manager who's not only good but appropriate? Um, well, I think certainly in credit space, I think the the, the key, real key thing here is um, the credit selection skills. Uh, that's that's just fundamental to everything. I mean, we mm -hmm. could, there's this fixed income, and we could we could get you know we could get into a nice debate about active versus passive in terms of broad like equities and stuff like that. 
uh, and whether you can add value or not. Uh, however, I firmly believe in credit space, uh, active credit management is, is the way to go because I think there's a lot of real value that can be added from proper credit assessment to actually mitigate the default risk. You know, we're looking at credit spreads and mm -hmm. asset prices generally have been sort of pushed up because of QE. So, so the margins have actually become thinner. And so you know, in that environment, that's a real environment where sort of, you know, a really good credit manager can make, you know, make a, a huge difference in terms of delivering the returns that the pension funds actually need. So, so that's fundamental. Uh, above and beyond that, then, I think a lot will depend to some degree on the, um, the nature of the credit. So, you know, if you're looking more private credit markets uh, mm -hmm. where you're needing people with experience of working out on defaults and what experience have they actually, uh, you know, have they actually got on actually doing that, for instance. So, you know, that, that's a particular area to look at. And also things like, you know, sort of accessing the bonds and sort of, you know, the trading the bonds facilities, you know, these can be actually quite, uh, quite illiquid. So, sort of, you know, what access have they got to the market and how quickly can they sort of you know, make, make trades, et cetera, uh, as and when appropriate. So they're all the sort of real key things. Mm -hmm. And then sort of, you know, just, just you know, um, the, the overall credentials of the people are you know, clearly quite key in terms of that sort of the insights in the market and being able to share and communicate those insights. Um, because uh, you know, a key thing from a, from a trustee perspective is, you know, they, yes, they want confidence in the manager, but they've also got to be able to monitor that manager going forward. And if the, the, the managers haven't got the communication skills to articulate what can be very quite complex assets, uh, explain the underlying performance and dynamics, it becomes very difficult to build that confidence in the trustee board in terms of actually monitoring the manager going forward. So again, so the ability to actually communicate uh, around the asset class, uh, communicate the performance, etc., is actually a real key component as well. Good, good. But thank you, Carl. Um, so Peter. Would you go with a household name or do you look for something else? Um, I don't think one has ever just gone purely for a household name, although there's, I suppose there's the IBM moment. Um, that doesn't mean all household names are perfect and not um, can fall in terms of their own group think. Um, I just think you have to pick the people who are appropriate and can deal in the specialist asset class that you're dealing with, because bonds is, is a specialism. I think in terms of going back to the previous question, um, so the question about choosing a bond manager, um, a lot of the fundamentals haven't changed, but I think what things will I would do now differently and ask further questions around. Um, one is around how they handled the COVID, the pandemic and the underwriting yeah. and triaging their investments and how they handled that. We'll come back to that later. But the other thing which is also important, which hasn't, don't think, been touched upon truly yet, is doing so in choosing any new managers is the responsible investment journey. I know we may talk about ESG later, but if you're choosing a new bond manager now, I think it's behoven, given the current environment, to consider what they're doing and try and delve a little bit beyond just what's um, a greenwashed ESE integration, which worked three or four years ago, but I think that sort of the story's moved on there. And well, what I'm quite interesting is not necessarily the motherhood and apple pie type statements, but it's more a question of what can they measure? What impact can they show? Um, how are they doing things differently? You know, with TCFD reporting coming all our ways over the next few years in different guises and different timescales. Um, how are you aligned with the Paris alignment, the transition pathway? There's a whole you could do two, about three round tables on this topic just purely in bond space but all I'm just trying to get there is is that you know it, it's it's an important topic and managers and like investors are still grappling with this but you need to try and find a partner going forward who can help you on that journey so that's about the ESG response investment journey and going back to that pandemic I think a lot of underwriting by bond managers will, would have stress test bad scenarios Okay. But I'm not sure many managers would have underwritten for the fact, you know, the world stops for a year, you know, in terms of basically for some company, no cash flow. You know, some people have continued quite nicely, you know, are they sick cool or not? So it's a question of how you've underwritten and it's been a great stress test of their underwriting skills. Yeah. And no doubt their underwriting scenarios going forward will include these types of scenarios. Um, God forbid there are more pandemics in the future. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I and 
the drawdowns that they experienced. I think it's highly important to understand why, what type of asset classes, was it through distress telling, just sort of distress pricing, mark to market issues, or was there fundamentally something wrong with those underlying bonds or loans that they had invested in? And then understanding the recovery journey. And again, the triaging that they put in place and what is money good? You know, that, that, that's about monitoring. But in looking for a new bond manager, it's understanding how they manage that process and what lessons they have learned, because people always learn lessons yeah. and how that makes them stronger going forward. So I, I think there are a number of areas there which we can all um, make our own processes stronger and ask the right type of questions. Um, so, so that's that, I'll, thank I'll you. leave it there. Fair. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Ian, quickly on to you. Um, when you're looking to award a mandate and you're sitting opposite a, a bond fund manager, what are, what are you looking for them to show you? Um, so, so if I, if I talk about it in terms of our of our CDI uh, portfolio, mm -hmm. I think you know a lot of the the comments that Carl's made are, are absolutely you know valuable. We need to think about we need to think about their particularly their their credit analysis skills because we're looking to hold um, uh, a credit for it. Um, well, you know, ideally until it's until it matures, and uh, then we want to make sure we're getting the income from that. So all of the all of the elements that go into um, working out and, and and analyzing the security of that income flow, and um, from the nature of the business to the 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 ESG credentials, and um, over time, and um, are really are really important. So we expect that to be embedded in the the process. But it but it is a huge universe. Um, there's we're we're not only looking at sort of you know investment grade we're looking at across the sort of the, the wide range and um, including liquids so access is, is absolutely critical you need to get managers who who understand the the actual um um environment that they are working in that they are, they are looking looking at and um, and so we we use a, a fiduciary to to do that groundwork for us now, what that then means is that we need to be very careful about the philosophy that we are looking for from our um, um, from our managers, and that that philosophy is is clearly communicated and communicated back to us through our fiduciary. And so, so that's 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 what's key to us. That's good, chair. Thank you, Ian. And finally, on this point, Killian, what what are you looking for? Um, look, I, I very much agree. Ability to um, assess the credit worthiness uh, from a long term, a uh, short term and long term perspective is absolutely key. Uh, it's more, even more key than ever before these days. And uh, going away from just providing me with 10 slides on ESG towards actually evidencing how ESG slash RI considerations have made a, a real life impact in the portfolio. Uh, that's the key challenge that we uh, uh, ask managers and candidates to solve these days. Uh, it's a, I very much agree uh, with, with, with Peter. Uh, the world has moved on, we've all progressed and we are well, more ambitious uh, than ever um, to integrate these relevant factors to uh, the ongoing portfolio management processes. But I think that a lot of managers uh, are still very much struggling uh, with uh, maybe integrating it, but even if they have achieved the integration, with showing that and evidencing it, reporting it back to the clients. A, a uh, report on um, ESG scores uh, is to a certain extent informative, but uh, it can only be this, let's say, the tip of the iceberg of what you actually want to see, as there is way more uh, uh, to this. Gotcha. So thank you, Kane. And of course, we've we've mentioned ESG uh, quite a lot there. So let, let's let's tackle this this issue. Um, Killian, sticking with you, um, how are you wanting to see ESG factored into your fixed income portfolio? Um, look, I think uh, our trustees are very clear uh, that that in particular climate change is a key systematic mm. risk that needs mm. to be addressed. Uh, we uh, have recently issued a, a climate change strategy. Uh, which will result in us divesting from all coal-related investments by 2022. Um, so we are engaging with all our managers of all asset classes to, to integrate in particular climate change, but also other 
RI slash ESG factors into their investment processes. Um, and of course, you're facing at some point the, the big question uh, between um, divesting uh, or in, in engaging. So in case of coal, obviously, we chose for divestment path. Mm -hmm, okay. uh, However, I think all it's equal, we would certainly prefer rather an engagement route uh, that would then result in firms changing their long term strategy and uh, and uh, and preparation for uh, for the, the energy transition over time, aligning their strategies more uh, with the Paris uh, uh, targets. Uh, that's the ambition. Uh, and of course, this ambition will not succeed or will not succeed with the ambition with regards to each and every issue that we have. So uh, divesting and changing portfolio allocations towards more greener firms, uh, I'm pretty sure will happen over time. Um, but uh, we also want to avoid to just rejig the portfolio towards, let's say, uh, only the more greener sectors to look greener on paper, but actually not having made an impact. Because as asset owners, we have the ability and also responsibility to act and engage and, and to use, uh, even if we don't have a given, we don't have a vote in, in, in fixed income land, mm -hmm. uh, we still can make an impact. We are important to an issuer uh, as uh, uh, as uh, uh, the uh, institution that provides funding. Got you. Thank you very much, Killian. Ian, um, what's what's your SG strategy? What's on your your checklist of things you want to include? Yeah, uh, this 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 really is a topic we could talk about for days and days. And uh, there's, there's so much I agree with, agree with Killian. With sort of a lot of these points. So um, we are we're currently developing reporting, and um, mm -hmm. reporting reporting is a massive issue. It's it's often uh, sporadic and and unreliable at best, and it's also backward looking. So the 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 concept of actually sort of making decisions around what you're seeing in reporting doesn't make a lot of sense. And um, the the idea of of this sort of do you divest or do you or do you actually engage is really important. Again, reporting doesn't really reflect what how companies are developing their their forward looking strategy. And um, so so it's getting to a position whereby we can make sensible decisions based on all of the, the fundamental reasons that we've always had about sort of comparing price and and resilience and and and, and, and the purchase of bonds and bringing in all the ESG factors mm -hmm. that we can properly identify that will support these decisions. Now I, I just don't think we're there. We're at we're we're in a position whereby we can and um, rely on the on the reporting at the moment. It's developing. It's, okay. it's moved a long way. But we're not we're not there yet to be able to 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 work solely on on the reporting. <clears throat> so so I prefer engagement. I prefer developing kind of um, our 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 relationships with through the managers with about our philosophy and what we're looking for. So the managers are then applying that in their discussions with with the 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 individual um, uh, credits. So it's that kind of approach. I, I would I would say we are favouring at the moment. Okay, okay. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> so, Alan, um, you did say at the beginning that most of your DB skis are on the path to the end game now. Um, if you're looking for an exit <clears> and, <throat> and turn it all over, I mean, is ESG important to you guys on the DB side of things? I think that ESG is important to me, whether I'm in DB land mm -hmm. or DC land, when it was called ethical investment or socially responsible investment, I was something of a skeptic. I am, however, a very big fan of E, S and G, provided that we give equal weight to each of those initials. And I see a world very soon where there won't be ESG investors and non-ESG investors. ESG should be embodied in everything that we do. What worries me at the moment as a trustee is that I'm on the receiving end of a bureaucratic paper chase. From all quarters, I'm being asked to comply with this target and that target by a particular date. And it's so overwhelming that if we aren't careful, the whole concept of ESG will become a, a box ticking affair mm -hmm rather than a brain box consideration. 
Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you very much for that, Alan. Um, Jim, are you finding out that uh, your clients are making demands on you in terms of working SG into your fixed income? I don't think we have a conversation with the client, as you've heard from the others, yeah. without ESG coming up. Um, I think there are different styles. I think some clients want a different approach. Yeah. So like active management, I, I think this is a sector where you know, there are different ways to, to do it. That said, they want to see an impact on portfolios. Like the greenwashing element, I, I think, has really come to the fore and people want to know that you're really practicing um, something that will make a difference and usually through engagement is the way to make that happen. You know, as Ian alluded to, one of the issues that we face is you know, we, we can do exclusion lists, we can do kind of positive impact, best in class screening, um, but one of our principles, for example, is to choose companies that may even be poor at ESG, but if we can engage with them to make them a lot better, we view that as a success. But reporting that's backward looking, you know, might penalize the client who's trying to do that. So I think we are squarely, you know, at the point where, you know, we like many managers have integrated ESG into our analysis. Um, but we as an industry now really need to do a better job of defining what it means you know, how it can be used, um, but really evidencing um, the impact that we're having on portfolios and doing that in a really pragmatic way that makes sense to clients and, you know, not always in the way that might be overly prescriptive, you know, by regulators or through some really um, kind of ill-defined framework. So it's evolving quickly. Um, we're trying to be partners and um, and 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 good strategic thinkers alongside of our clients to make this really work across their portfolios. Okay, okay. Um, the, the topic of engagement has come up. Now, engagement in equities uh, seems pretty straightforward. You're an owner, so you know, the board should be listening to you. Um, if you're a bondholder, you probably don't have the same. I'm assuming you don't have the same relationship uh, with the board. So, so how how easy is it to engage to get a company to change their practices? Um, I, we have found it surprisingly easy. I mean, we're not voting stakeholders yeah. in the way equity holders are, but they actually, these companies are accessing debt markets on a very frequent basis. <clears throat> and if they are told that, let's say you can sell your bond at a quarter percentage point um, lower if you didn't have these ESG risks, um, I, I think they start to listen, right? They see the, the real cost and impact. Um, but aside from that, they, they now know that, you know, with the trends that are unfolding, you know, they have an obligation, I think, to deliver on more than just one front. So as a stakeholder on the bond side, you know, saying to them, we would lend to you, you know, if you can do this, or we'll lend to you at a lower rate if you can do this. I actually okay. think that they're very receptive to hearing that. That's good, Jim. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, Carl, we've also heard there that maybe the reporting is still still growing. I mean, is that what you're seeing in terms of ESG in, in fixed income? Yes, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I think it's a quickly sort of changing landscape. Mm -hmm. And I think as various speakers have already commented on, it's, it's not just about looking backwards. It is about looking forwards as well. And I think it's a bit of a journey here in terms of the reporting which the trustees get both from the from the advisors and from the managers, um, you know, to actually see evidence of the um, the actions the the managers are actually taking and seeing what value that's actually added into the portfolio, uh, and those things that you know the the ESG risks are actually being um, appropriately accounted for. I mean, fundamentally, at the end of the day, you know, ESG, you know, we, we, the importance of it. We just need to look around the world at what's going on more broadly. And we can see how important sort of the, these issues are, uh, and they are they, they pose real world risks to all the companies in which uh, all the investments our clients invest in, and so it's absolutely imperative that the, the, these are actually looked at and, and they form part of the overall package of risk. It is one of many risks, and it's important that they are actually judged and sized in the way that you know, credit risk more broadly has been looked at historically. Good to you. Thank, thank you, Carl. Um, Peter, ESG, is that something you'd speak to your your bond guys about? 
Um, as I think I previously indicated, um, yes, mm -hmm. certainly. OK, so what, what, sort, of thing, what sort of topics are, are on your agenda there? Uh, well, as I, as I mentioned, was um, I suppose what, what I'm trying to change the conversation away from not just integration, which is mm -hmm. to me, in some respects, a past conversation, though it's still important. Yeah. Um, it's more a question of the impact. How can you help me and how can you measure it? As I think everyone's alluded to, everyone's on the journey and reporting is hard. And the, the managers have to. It's not a question of if now, it's just it's a question of doing business now that they have to put the infrastructure in place to provide that reporting. Now, I appreciate there's all manner of issues between loans, private equity sponsors, um, liquid QCIP type products, you know, what's liquid and what's available. But just because it's hard doesn't mean that you should do what do what you can and then lobby and engage to ensure that it becomes better over time. So this is a journey. I don't expect perfection today, but you know, we've got to start somewhere and it may be the easier bits, you know, we start off with. But you know, we but we, we have to take that forward. And uh, it's not a question of and nice to have, you know, the world has changed and you have to not just as investors, but you have to, as Alan was saying, there's a whole series of ever increasing demands for reporting and on trustees and other asset owners to report on these things. And going back to your point about engagement, um, I've had this view for many years, um, is that for fixed income investors or the managers, they can play an important role in having discussions with companies. In respect of equities, you know, if you're buying in the, in the, in the market, you're buying secondhand equities, you're not providing capital. You know, IPOs, it's different. But for, but when you're providing, especially for, for new issuance, and especially for companies which regularly tap the market, you can say, look, in order to, to, to have, for me to lend you money, you have to provide the following criteria, or at least improve your reporting on those criteria. And ultimately, you may turn around, if you can't re produce that reporting, we may not lend you that money, or if we do, we may charge you more for lending you that money. And so, you know, I, I think for a lot of CFOs and corporates, they can have to see the writing on the wall and provide that information. And it's not just purely relying on the MCI data and other aspects. It's about proper engagement. And in some respects, I think bond investors can have more influence than, than, than equity investors on, on these aspects. And that's always been the case. It's just been easier for people to talk about equities where the traditional ESG mm. conversation started. But especially with pension funds where, you know, with then game planning de-risking, where an awful lot of your monies will be held in contractual fixed income type investments. Um, that role of engagement from your managers will become more important. It was no, never unimportant, but the focus and the publicity and the transparency around that will have to improve greatly. Good, yeah. uh, th thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, we are coming up on time now, and actually, I'd just like to, to end our conversation with just a, a look forward. And I know as we've been speaking for the past hour, a lot of you have actually mentioned about what the, what the future holds, but maybe you could just to, to summarise to end on. Um, Jim, could you just give us your outlook for the fixed income markets? Well, I, I think rates could rise a bit further, but I actually think mm -hmm. from these levels, um, rises will be contained. That said, I, I would focus on growth related assets, um, okay. credit risk, um, some mortgage risk, um, increasingly look at things that are secured by real assets, you know, which should benefit from the ongoing recovery. Mm -hmm. And you're still not paid enough, I think, to compensate for taking a lot of interest rate risk. So I'd stick um, probably a little bit shorter duration. But I think much of the rate rise that we should have expected is probably behind us now. Bonds are now, you know, at fair value, if not a little bit above. They've priced in higher inflation. So a, a lot of the pain I think that we've seen in the last few months um, will not persist. Good, good. You. Uh, thank you very much there, Jim. And would anybody else like to make a comment about or well, on their outlook for the fixed income markets? Is there... I mean, I think that fixed income market will be a, a very interesting place for young investment managers to work 
in future. In the past, it was always regarded as a, a boring, poor relation of the equity market. But now mm -hmm. there are so many ways that we want to tap the fixed income market that there is opportunity for uh, real creativity that uh, is win-win for both the borrower and the lender. Thank you, Alan. Would anybody else like to, to give their view on this? Uh, on I, think, I think that for me, I think um, certainly there's some interesting opportunities out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think sort of, you know, with the the the, the fiscal the fiscal medicine that um, has been provided in the last twelve months that has supported so many companies and um, I, I do worry that perhaps you know once we things do start reverting to the new normal whatever that looks like um, the the risk of uh, defaults will actually potentially rise um, so I think that whilst there's sort of attractive opportunities out there I think having a good credit manager coming back to the conversation we had earlier with the right credit skills that can really mitigate those risks, I think is going to be absolutely key to actually generating the returns that you, you're hoping to get from the assets at current pricing. Because I do think pricing is uh, has been um, uh, inflated on the back of QE. Uh, and I do think you know there is that might might be the it might be a, a massively high probability risk, but nevertheless there's a real risk of inflation increasing and the impact that that could have over the medium term. Gotcha. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a, a comment, Mark. I mean, I, I think this sort of comes back through the through the comments everyone's been making around sort of um, credit quality, but to back to strategy for for a venture scheme investor. So, <clears throat> whilst pricing can support and can can improve the outcome of the strategy, I think ultimately the the, the strategy trumps most most things. So actually being able to um, uh, systematically secure the income that we're that we're that we're looking for over time is what is what we're needing to do, um, and that then becomes a a, a funding uh, discussion for 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 the sponsor. Now, obviously, if we can if we can improve the the or take advantage of opportunities that arise in uh, uh, pricing and sort of buying income and, and the quality of income we're looking at with the Either with cash or with growth from from growth assets, then then that that improves the funding discussion. But ultimately, you need to have a strategy to get to the place you want to get to the income you need to have, and um, and so you, really pricing is is, is I mean, it's not secondary, but it's 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 not the first consideration. Thank you, Ian. Okay, guys. Um, that was fascinating. Of course, I'm very timely to to revisit the fixed income market for the this series of conversations with with what's happening at the moment. I think we've made some very good points we made and clearly give us a few things to think about. I'd like to thank you all for, for taking part in this discussion and for sharing your views. I'd especially like to thank our sponsor, Janice Henderson, for making all this happen. So thank you, guys. Right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.